Welcome, folks, to the Hunter's Quest podcast. This is your host, Hunter McWaters. It's great to be with you guys, as always. And um, this week, I want to do a solo podcast um, where I run through a couple things. Uh, I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of a recap of the Audad hunt I did recently. I realized I never really kind of recapped that hunt, and it was pretty cool. I want to share with you guys. Um, and then also it's application season. So, um, you know, I've only been in this game for about four years now, but, um, being that I'm from out of state and, you know, I have to approach this, um, from a standpoint of gathering content and going on as many hunts as I can fit in. Um, I have learned quite a bit. I'm not an expert by any means, but um, you know, this year a friend of mine from Idaho was sending me messages about Colorado application strategy. So I know a little bit. Um, I know probably more than some. Um, you know, I've put in the work researching the different states. Again, I'm not an expert, but I've learned quite a bit. So I wanted to run you through a little bit of application strategy and kind of my application strategy. So it might, you know, Obviously, like I said, I'm producing a TV show, a podcast, and a YouTube channel. I'm going on six or seven hunts this year. Um, so my strategy is going to be a little bit different than the average person. I get that. Um, I understand I'm very fortunate and very blessed to be able to have this problem of, you know, like almost too many choices. Um, but, you know, like I said, Being that I'm in that situation, I'm blessed, but I've learned a lot, and so I want to share some out with you guys, and hopefully some of these nuggets will help you as you're kind of um, applying for different different states and stuff like that. So I want to go ahead and say right right off the bat, like I apply pretty much everywhere, Um, and if I don't, I'm at least buying points pretty much everywhere. Um, You know, even places where I think I'll probably never hunt there. I'm just go ahead and buying points anyway, because you just never know. Um, You know, I remember as soon as I found out about the point system and after that first trip I did, when I realized like, this is what I want to do, I just started buying points everywhere. And, um, you know, point creep is real. More and more people are wanting to do this stuff, which is good. Um, And, you know, like I always say, when it comes to this stuff, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is now. So, you know, don't beat yourself up, whatever. Don't get discouraged. Um, just start now and, you know, start getting points and accumulating points as many places as you can while being financially responsible, um, you know, because you just never know. And you, you can't win unless you play the game. So, um, you know, don't go negative, just, just play the game and, you know, it can be kind of stressful, kind of weird with all the moving parts and stuff like that. Um, but if you have a strategy, um, you know, even in two or three years of kind of doing it right, um, you can get into a place like where I'm at, where you have lots of different options and, um, and you can like have a rotation where you're getting into good hunts every year. So, uh, before we do that, I do want to just jump in a little bit. Um, I do want to mention some partners. Onyx Hunt um, obviously is a huge tool when I'm researching new areas, new hunts. Um, and, you know, just to be honest, I still use Go Hunt Insider. Um, it's a great tool, um, you know, for mapping. I still and always have used Onyx, it's the best out there. Um, but I'm not going to lie, Go Hunt Insider is still a really good tool and I use it. Um, and they're not a partner of mine, but I just, I'm just being honest with you guys. It's a good tool. Um, you know, top rut is another option for draw odds and stuff like that. And I think Onyx is looking at ways to kind of move into, um, helping more, you know, also I do use hunt and fool as well. So, um, there's a lot of information available through hunt and fool. Uh, they have advisors. They can actually talk you through, uh, application strategies and stuff like that. So um, they're another great resource. Um, and I think if you sign up for Go or yeah, Onyx um, Elite membership, you get a Hunt and Fool subscription as well. Um, and you know, especially if you don't have kind of the time that I'm able to put into this, 
um, which is a lot. It's a lot of time and effort um, using Hunt and Fool and having like kind of an advisor to kind of walk you through stuff is super helpful. So I definitely recommend Hunt and Fool. Um, Onyx obviously is a great tool for research, um, but I will probably be mentioning Go Hunt Insider as well because I still use their filtering tool uh, during application season. Um, so let's just jump in here, guys. Uh, first, I want to run you through this Audad hunt. Um, so this this hunt, it's uh, it's an exotic species in Texas. If you don't know anything about Audad, they're a North African species. They're actually, they're ref referred to as sheep, but they're not actually sheep. They're not actually goats either. They're their own kind of animal. Um, they come from North Africa. They were brought into Texas and uh, New Mexico in the 1950s by a couple of GIs who discovered them in North Africa while uh, deployed during World War II and brought them over as a species to hunt. And now they reign, they roam freely in greater numbers in the American Southwest than they do in their home ranges, um, <clears throat> which is good and bad on different levels, I guess, depending on how you look at it. But um, they've thrived and now they're free ranging wild populations that are just, um, I mean, they're in Mexico now. I, I saw some in Mexico on this hunt cause I was literally hunting right on the Rio Grande. Um, I even think there's some in, in parts of California. I'm not really sure. I don't know about Arizona, but definitely New Mexico and Texas is where you find your biggest supply of them. Um, and being that they're a quote unquote invasive species or an exotic, um, you know, it's cheap and easy to get a tag. Um, and you know, in Texas you can pretty much do whatever you want to kill them cause they're exotics. Um, New Mexico, there's over-the-counter options, although it's a very tough hunt, I know from experience, because I've done it, but it is doable. There's over-the-counter Barbary sheep tags available. And Texas, like I said, the tag is cheap and easy to get. However, um, there's almost no public land in Texas, unfortunately. So you're gonna have to probably pay an outfitter or a guide or a rancher or something for the opportunity to hunt these things. Um, I went with West Texas Hunt Organization, uh, they're a great uh, organization. They have access to a, tons of different ranches. They do mule deer, hogs, javelina, audad, some other exotics and stuff. But if you want to do this hunt, uh, reach out to Mike McKinney over at West Texas Hunt Organization. Um, I had a great experience with them. Uh, they have DIY options, they have semi-guided, and they have fully guided options. Um, and uh, so it's not cheap. I won't say it's cheap, but um, as far as the type of hunt and the terrain, um, and kind of the uniqueness of the species, it's, it's affordable. Um, I think you can get it anywhere from, I think on the low end, maybe 4,000, 4,500, all the way up to probably in the eight nines, maybe tens. I don't know. Um, but it's usually going to be in that four to 6,000 range. Um, and you know, on my hunt that included a guide and a, he also cooked for us and lodging. Um, so it's a really cool hunt. Um, the way we did it is we flew into El Paso, Texas, and then drove about two hours to the Van Horn, Texas area. At that point, we met up with our guide, Steve. He drove us to the ranch. Um, the other thing I want to mention about these things is they live in... Um, really amazing epic landscapes. So I'm from, you know, the mid-Atlantic. I have always been fascinated by it and I love the desert, especially, um, you know, given that these exotics, you can hunt them anytime, pretty much anytime throughout the year. I really love the desert in the wintertime. I think it's gorgeous. The weather is great. Um, and there's just something, I don't know, there's just something really enchanting, magical, whatever you want to say about the desert for me. Um, I just find it really beautiful. Um, so I had a great time. Um, you know, it was the first night, it was like 20 degrees or something. So it is cold at night. This was mid January. And um, the first day we got in, um, you know, kind of got situated in camp, whatever. And then the first morning uh, we woke up, I shot my rifle. Um, always good to check your rifle when you're coming on a hunt like that uh, after flying, especially different altitudes and stuff like that. For whatever reason, I did have to make a few adjustments on the zero on my rifle. I think it was probably due to altitude. 
because um, my custom dial on my loop hold, which I love, is set for like 7,000 feet, because that's what I do a lot of my hunting is kind of higher altitude, but uh, we were down closer to, I think, 2,000 or less on this hunt, so um, I did have to make a few adjustments on my zero, but nothing big, and then we went out and glassed, and um, literally within like five minutes of glassing, uh, we found a huge group of probably... I'd say between 30 and 40 sheep. Um, and at that point we set up the spotters and we just started picking the group apart to see if there were any good rams in there. Now, one of the main reasons to have a guide, other than obviously to kind of show you around, is these animals, when you're not used to looking at them, they're incredibly hard to judge by yourself. So. The first group of sheep we saw, you know, I was looking at them and I was saying, oh, there's, you know, that one looks good. That one looks nice. And every time Steve would be like, no, nah, that's a you. No, nah, that's a you. So when you're not used to looking at them, uh, obviously the ewes have horns as well. And they, they look, they look big. I mean, they um, even, or we would see some that are like young rams. And um, he, he just kept being like, no, trust me. That's, that's nothing. That's nothing. So that's the one of the main reasons why to have a good guide is just kind of hold you back from shooting a ewe or a small ram um, because it's really hard to tell when you're not used to looking at them. But the big ones will have, you know, they'll carry their mass all the way out. They'll be in that. And I think, you know, Mike over at West Texas Hunt Organization likes to have, I think, a 28 or 29 inch minimum on rams, which is which is good, a good size ram. Um, so you know they'll have they'll have mass one thing steve was telling me is that if you could look like you could pass a basketball through the curl on their horn that's a good one um other thing is their hair the the mature males will have very long hair on the front on their neck and on the front of their uh front legs and it'll look like they're walking with bell bottle bell bottoms like you can just see the hair like flapping up every time they walk so Again, I was looking at some smaller rams and kind of like wasn't sure, but he, he assured me they, they were not um, good rams. So um, this particular ranch, there was one big mountain that we saw the group of sheep on the, the front, I guess it'd be like the south end of this mountain face. So we drove to the very um, north side of it and crawl and you know hiked up a draw to the top and we're just working our way along the top of this ridge glassing looking for sheep and you know we saw that group in the morning then we saw probably two or three more groups of like four or you know 10 to 15 animals still not really seeing any big rams and then towards the end of the day we kind of had come back and relocated that big group of sheep that we'd seen that morning um, we felt pretty confident there wasn't any big rams in there, but we decided we were going to get a closer look just to make sure. Uh, so we snuck in, and it was cool. We got into about 150, 200 yards of this big, big group of sheep and got a chance to really observe them. And, um, you know, I already kind of had a respect for this hunt and, and wanted to do it because of the time I'd spent last year in New Mexico looking for them and just how awesome the places where they live are. But after like getting up close and watching and watching them interact with each other, um, I started to kind of fall in love with these things. Um, to be honest, when I came in, like I wasn't like super, I knew I liked where they lived, but I wasn't like super stoked about the animals themselves. I almost honestly thought they were kind of weird looking and, um, I was just it, I just kind of looked at it as a cool opportunity for a hunt, but wasn't like super interested in the animals themselves. Um, but that's completely different now. Like I love these things, but it's um, watching them up close, interacting that first night um, started that process. And so again, I we're, we're me and Luke are looking at uh, are looking at young rams. Like, oh, that's that's definitely a good one, right? And every time Steve's like, nope, that's that's tiny. Like, that's not a good one. Let's keep looking. Let's keep looking. Um, so, and if you guys know me, you know if you're listening, I um, don't normally pass up good opportunities on animals. Um, but that's another reason to have that guide. Like I said, is 
he was able to kind of just keep us in check and and let us know like all right let's keep going like we'll get a better opportunity so uh, we watched those sheep and then we basically hiked back and had a great night hanging out um, second day we went to a different part of the ranch and after driving a couple miles we glassed another area and we found a bachelor group uh, at first we thought it was about six rams and right away steve could tell they were big um, so like I said, they, had the, they carry their mass out pretty far. They have the big the hair. It looks like you can pass a basketball through their curl. And then also on the bigger, more mature rams, you'll see that the, the space between each horn is very slim. I mean, like, so, like the really big ones, they say, even like it starts to touch. Um, and my ram, whenever it eventually got mine, like it was maybe quarter maybe an eighth of an inch of flesh just between the two so that's how you could tell it was a good ram and um so anyway we, we saw those we snuck around and we were able to we kind of spooked a mule deer on the way in and we thought that might blow us up the other thing about these things which i didn't know going in but they have very good sense of smell and they will wind you and get out so we were being really careful to kind of get cover and keep the wind in our face and work like they were on a ridge over here and we were working around kind of below the um, the crest of this hill to get as close as we could to pop up and relocate them. And finally when we did, um, we realized it was a group of probably about 30 rams, a batch group, with, and like almost all of them were shooters, if not all of them were shooters. They were bachelored up, I guess the breeding season had ended, and they were all together, and they, it was so cool because they were just fighting and, and uh, you know, just button horns and going at it. And, um, and so anyway, we get up there. Um, I'm trying to see. We, we sneak in. It all happened really fast. And that's the other thing. Like, for me, like, when I'm hunting by myself, so on one hand, I was glad to have Steve there, the guide. On the other hand, like, I do like hunting by myself when possible. And the only reason I had a guide is because, just to be honest, the DIY uh, hunts this year were already sold out uh, with Mike. So um, kind of my only option was to go guided, um, which is fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But I just know from experience that I tend to I tend to kind of check out and not use my head as much, which means I, I kind of don't learn quite as much. But, so that being said, um, when I'm alone, if I was alone, it kind of would have forced me to make decisions on my own and, and really think, okay, how am I gonna approach these animals? What's, but instead I'm kind of following Steve and then he's like, it, it happened really fast. He's like, okay, like, let's get up here and and basically they were there, they were like 350 yards. So anyway, I crawl up and like I said, I feel like if I was on my own, I would have had more time to digest what's happening and make a solid plan in my brain. Whereas this was just almost like I was thrown in and it's like, okay, go, like go up there and shoot. And so I wasn't really like mentally prepared for it, to be honest. So I got up there and then, then I have to have this weird mental shift of, Okay, I'm no longer just following this guy's direction. I it's on me now. So it's this weird shift where you're like kind of following someone else and then you have to like mentally take the reins back and say, "Okay, now it's on me." And so that's jarring for me. That's one reason why I don't like hunting with guides. And and Steve's great. He's a great guide. I'm not knocking him at all. I'm just saying for me, it's why I like to do it my own. I I can take it at my own pace. I can figure it out and I can it just it just makes more sense to me mentally. So I had this weird, I remember having this distinct mental shift of, okay, now it's on you. Now you got to figure this out. So anyway, we crawl up there, we get the things in camera. Again, there's like 30 sheep. So I'm also trying to figure out which one is the biggest one, which one I can get, I can communicate effectively to Luke. Okay, this is the animal I'm shooting. And, um, and it worked out really well because and I've looked back at the footage a lot, and I think there may have been one or two other rams in there that might have been an inch or two bigger than mine, but he was one of the biggest, and I think one of the oldest rams in there. I was looking at him compared to another ram uh, in some of the footage, and 
The other ram looks like more muscular and like big and like toned and darker in color, but his his horns had less mass. My my ram, he had more mass, a little bit deeper of a curl, but he and he was also lighter in color and looked a little like he like a little bit less toned, like like he was past his prime. So I think mine was actually one of the older rams in there. Um, and he was still fighting and jostling around and everything with everybody else. But uh, the other thing about it was he was kind of standing off to his, you know, off by himself a little bit. To the, to the, he was the furthest right, the furthest animal to the right, kind of off a little bit from the group. So I could tell he was a good ram. I could tell he looked old. And he was, it was easy to communicate to Luke, okay, this is the animal I'm going to go for. So that's what I said. I said, all right, Luke. He's the one all the way to the right. So anyway, um, I get in there and, and looking back in retrospect, this is kind of one reason why I want to spend more time training this off season because I do have a tendency to, to hammer the trigger and I do have a tendency to kind of want to pull my head up out of the gun um, a little bit. And, and so what I think I ended up doing was maybe just pulling pulling it a little bit, like kind of anticipating the recoil and hammering the trigger more than I should. And and he was quartering to me slightly. So uh, uh, he was at 350 plus yards, um, dialed it and sent it and I hit him, but it was far back. It was, it was pretty far back, you know, could have been a liver shot. Not exactly sure. Um, but it hit him. It hit him pretty hard, but it was it was it was far back. Um, I'll be honest. And so, and and so again with the recoil and everything, I lost the animal completely. The whole group went off. So I and I thought I saw one kind of peel off and go around. Like looked like it might have been hurt, but I wasn't sure. So then we sit there and I have that sinking. You know, we all know the feeling. Uh, that sinking feeling of uh, you know maybe I didn't make a great shot. Not really sure. The guys thought they'd heard an impact. So anyway, we looked back at the footage and it looked like it confirmed that I did hit the thing, but it was it was far back. So at this point, um, we're, we're sneaking up to try to find the thing. And um, so <laughs> I love Seekins Precision. They're great guns. Um, however, I do have a couple magazines that I've found that do not feed as well as the original magazine that came with my rifle. Um, so, I'm not exactly sure what happened, What? but we saw the Audad, he's about 100 yards, and I went to put in a new round into the gun, and I, again, I don't know exactly what happened. I know in retrospect, after inspecting the magazine, that one of my magazines doesn't feed well. So I think that played into it. But when I went to close the bolt, it just wouldn't go. And I, I really, I honestly don't know what happened. So I can't even tell you what happened because I don't know. But there have been a few times when cleaning my gun that I've done this and it's, it's hard to fix. It's basically what happens is your firing pin and your bolt gets engaged Um and then you cannot close the bolt without resetting it. And it's really hard to do with your hands. Like you kind of need a tool to do it. But anyway, it's not going in. I'm freaking out because I can see the auto at like 100 yards and he's kind of limping off. And I pull the thing out and I was like, oh no, like don't let this be happening again. And so I knew kind of how to fix it, but I wasn't exactly sure to be honest. And my adrenaline's going nuts. And so I start trying to just fix this thing with my hands. And like, I'm just, rah, rah. and I look down and both my thumbs are bleeding. <laughs> Literally, I went into like full panic mode and like adrenaline and trying to fix this thing. I just trashed both my thumbs. One of my finger, like thumbnails was like ripped all the way up and the other one was just cut open bleeding. The other one had a huge blood blister. So then I'm trying to get them to help, Steve to help me with the thing and then the whole the whole bolt falls apart, like the firing pin comes out, everything. So here's where 
my practice in the off season paid off because I had intentionally one day completely taken the whole bolt apart just in case this happened in the field. And I am so glad I did because we would have been screwed if I didn't. But literally the whole, the, the firing pin falls out, another part falls, the whole thing comes apart. Fortunately, I had, done, I had taken the time to, to do this before, so I knew how to put the thing back together and somehow, you know, probably the Lord helping me out because I honestly don't even remember exactly how I got it fixed. Um, now I know how to fix it, but I don't know if it's the heat of the moment or whatever. I just, I was kind of stumped. But anyway, I was able to get the thing back together Finally, was able to get the bolt closed and put a sh- and put another round in, and we continued on. At that point, um, and this is another reason why I'm glad Steve was there because I kind of felt like we should go down the draw, and that's kind of where I was headed. He decided to peek over just into this little drainage right here to our left, and he comes back and he's like, "He's right there." He's right there. So this thing was literally just standing in the bottom. I mean, he was he was hurt bad. Um, and we, and so I walked up and I'm literally 20 yards from this thing, but all I can see is hair. I can't see the whole animal cause it's behind some brush. And, um, I, I thought he was dead and my, I had my scope covers closed for some reason, but I thought he was dead. And so I see him I raise my gun. I realize the scope, then I open the scope covers and then I just see hair and he's not moving. I'm kind of confused. And then he starts running and and like, you guys go to my Instagram right now. You can look back. There's, I made a reel of this kill shot. Um, but he starts running, you know, at that point, instinct takes over. Steve's like, wait, wait. And, uh, (laughs) fortunately, thank God I grew up hunting birds and shooting skeet. And my instinctual shooting is on point because he was full speed running up the other side of this of this drainage and I just pull up, I'm talking 15, 20 feet, bang, and just, and just dropped him right there. Uh, pretty wild. It was one of the wildest experiences ever. I can't wait to share the whole episode, but go to my YouTube, uh, or my Instagram right now and you can find uh, a YouTube short and there's also a real Instagram that shows this kill shot. It's absolutely wild. Uh, full speed running and just hammered him. Second time this happened this year. Um, so anyway, it was wild. We get up there. This this ram is super cool. I mean, and now I just have like a complete new level of respect for these things. I love these things. I think they're like super cool. This hunt is super cool. The environment is super cool. Um, Steve guessed the thing was about 11 years old. I actually showed a picture to Aaron Snyder at the Western Hunt Expo who he confirmed. He said it was 11 and a half years old. Um, they're only supposed to live to like 10 in the wild, supposedly. Uh, so this is a very old ram. He measured at 30 inches on one side and like 29 and three quarters on the other. And he was like broomed off on that side. So um, he was actually a little bit broomed on both sides. So he could have been a 31, 32 inch ram, but doesn't matter. In any event, just uh, awesome, mature ram, good mass. The other thing that's super cool about the mature ones is they do this thing where they like lay in the dirt and they'll like use their horns to flip dust up onto themselves. And the really mature ones will be like, they'll, they will have flipped dirt on themselves so much for so many years that like the, the side of their horn will actually be smoothed off completely smooth. Like it's, it's very like rigid ever. I mean, um, has ridges on it everywhere else, but on the, on those mature rams on the side, it's completely smoothed off from, from dirt. I thought that was super cool. And so, and like I said, the, the space in between on his, on his head was like maybe an eighth, eighth of an inch or quarter of an inch. Like, so super old, super cool Ram. Um, I did, I did, a lot of guys don't, but I did take, um, a good port. I took both back straps and some hind quarters out, um, and, uh, and took as much meat as we could. Um, Again, uh, super cool hunt, amazing animals. We got to watch, I forgot to mention too, after that first shot, we kind of had to watch the bachelor group for a while before we could m- advance any further because we didn't want to blow them off the country. And we got to watch for like probably 10 minutes while just they were just raking bushes, fighting, pushing each other down, like pushing each other down the hill. I have another really cool reel, go on my Instagram right now or YouTube of 
of just of the Rams fighting. We got tons of cool footage of them button heads and fighting and pushing each other around. Um, just awesome. You could even hear across the canyon like thwack every now and then of the things button heads. Very cool. I was kind of like not in the headspace because I was like thinking about the shot, but we got some epic footage. Luke got him some epic footage of them fighting. And I came out of this with even more of a love and respect for the animal and the environment. So much so that I I already booked my hunt to do this again next year. It's um, it's such a cool hunt, so unique, um, and you can do it in like you know that January time frame. Um, and uh, I highly recommend it, guys. A very cool hunt. Um, so I guess my main takeaways there are know your gear, know how to put it back together if it falls apart, um, and make sure you're practiced up and um, I know I'm going to spend more time this year uh, in the off season practicing my long range shooting and my form and all that stuff. Luckily, thank the Lord, it all worked out. Um, but there's always room for improvement. Um, but do an odd ad hunt sometime, guys. It is super cool, and uh, I can't wait to go back again. So anyway, that's how it went down. The next day, I pretty much, uh, we, we hung out in camp. We, we grilled some steaks, uh, drank some Topo Chico's. <laughs> uh, the next morning, I love the country so much. Me and Luke just went out and did, got some photos and some videos, some drone footage. I went on a little rock hunt hike. found some really cool rocks, um, some crystals and stuff. So, um, and yeah, I just, I didn't want to leave. Like, it was so cool. And then went straight from there to the Western Hunt Expo. Um, great trip, great trip. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to change batteries in my camera real quick and then talk about application strategy. All right, guys, we're back. Um, couple quick gear things to mention. Um, I am pretty tired uh, from last night. I just didn't sleep very well. And so as we head into this application strategy section, um, I just crushed one of these mountain ops, uh, what is it called? Fresh pineapple. It's just like an energy and focus shot. Uh, if you don't have time or don't have any ignite, uh, it's kind of convenient to grab one of these guys and um, I can already start to feel it kicking in a little bit. Um, and it's got 200 milligrams of caffeine, so just like a little cup of coffee, just boost. So um, check out Mountain Ops. Uh, the, you know, I use a ton of their products. I use their Ox supplement, which is cool for, it's supposed to uh, help with um, testosterone, natural testosterone production with all the stuff out there now, like attacking your testosterone from like microplastics to even some of the clothing we wear. Um, Anything you can do to help naturally boost your testosterone is good, and I have seen the positive effects from that. I use Ignite every single day. I use their creatine as well. I use their slumber gummies on hunts, uh, their packout bars, um, tons of great products, and Mountain Ops has really killer apparel, actually, too. This, this hoodie right here is a Mountain Ops hoodie. Um, I wear uh, some of their joggers, some of their grid fleece. Every piece of clothing I ever bought from Mountain Ops is really good. In fact, I even said to Trevor on a after a podcast we did not long ago, Trevor Farns, the CEO, I was like, man, you guys should look into doing a clothing line because your stuff is legit. Anyway, energy and focus shots. Use code QUEST at Mountain Ops. You're going to save money. You'll help me out. Uh, I really appreciate it. Use that code QUEST. You'll save 20% and you'll help me out. A couple of the gear notes from this hunt. Uh, this season in Oregon and on this hunt, I was using these Loophole uh, BX4 Range HD 10x42s. Um, the optical quality on the glass actually is surprisingly good. I was expecting it to be a little bit less than kind of some of their higher end glass just because they're a range. Uh, binocular, but actually the glass is just as good or better than um, my other loophole binoculars. And then obviously you got the rangefinder built right in. Uh, I think it's got angle compensation and line of sight. Um, they're really just convenient for these type of hunts where you know your your glass and stuff, and you want to just quickly be able to range 
uh, on rifle hunts and stuff like that. Um, I really like them. Um, I recommend them for sure. And Loophold is a great partner. So um, I love their rifle scopes, range finders, and these things are pretty nifty. The BX4 Range HDs. Last gear note, um, you know, like I said, that first shot wasn't great, um, but I'm shooting these Barnes bullets, and you know that had nothing to do with the bullets themselves. That was just kind of bad form on my part. But this solid copper ammunition, this is the Vortex. I'm also going to be shooting um, the LRX this year for kind of some more of my long range stuff. But this solid copper ammo, I have great consistency and performance and accuracy with this. I don't have time to load my own factory. I mean, I don't have time to load my own ammo. But this is some of the most accurate and repeatable factory ammo I ever used. I was using Barnes before I even became a partner with them. And thank the Lord, when I reached out to them, they were happy to partner with me as well. So they're one of my best partners. I love the people over there too. It's a great kind of family business. It's not really like technically a family business, I don't think, but it has a family environment, family atmosphere. Like the people over there are some of my favorite people. Uh, it's right there in like Mona, Utah. And uh, just great ammunition. And so I think one of the reasons why that thing was just sitting there hurt, even though I made a kind of less than ideal shot, was because this solid copper ammo just really packs a punch and just and just is devastating, guys. So check them out. Barnes, Vortex. They also have a couple new. I think they have a 7 PRC and a 300 PRC offering that's new for this year. I'm going to be um, trying out the 300 PRC. So check them out, guys. Um, and also, if you do reload, you can reload Barnes bullets as well. You don't have to get their ammo. Okay, enough on that. I want to talk about application strategy. Um, it's a big topic. I know at this point that some of these deadlines are kind of closed or closing soon, but I figure, you know, I can update you guys on my strategy. Maybe it's not for this year. Maybe it's next year for some of them. But still, I think it's helpful. And I, like I said, I've learned quite a bit. So. I have a list here of 14 states in which, in which I either have applications or points or will be buying points. So again, this is uh, somewhat next level to compared to most folks and what you guys are doing, but this is what I do. So, and it's given me a lot of opportunity to learn. So I'm going to run through my strategy for this year and hopefully some nuggets of info on stuff that can help you guys out. The most important thing like from a high level is to have, you know, I recommend a three state kind of rotation. Now, my advice to you guys would be if you're starting out, you want to look at what states to apply in and where to kind of, because like not everybody has the time or bandwidth to apply in 14 states. But if you're going to pick two or three to have a good solid rotation and some good opportunity, I would definitely recommend Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado. Just I like their systems. They're pretty simple. There's some great opportunity. And just by rotating those three, you can get a really, really, um, you can have a lot of really good opportunity. So Montana is known as an opportunity state. You know, that's kind of their deal. Um, you know, I think three points is the max amount of bonus points you can even get there. And so, you know, you're looking at on the zero point side of things, like a 60, 50, 60 percent uh, draw odds on a general tag for non-resident. You know, at one point, just because of some weird stuff, the way their system is, at one point, your odds drop pretty dramatically. But then back at two points, you go back up to, I think... 60 to 80 percent and then three percent three points is like a hundred percent draw on general tags and then preference points well i'll get into that later but i'm trying to say is montana is a great opportunity state um wyoming another great opportunity state um you know wyoming is a place where it's getting harder to draw tags i will be honest it's getting harder to draw those elk and deer tags however there is tons of great i mean it's it's the antelope opportunity state so especially for guys who are new starting out antelope's a great way to get into western hunting you can and i did this not this year but the previous year 
Um, I did an episode. You can go watch the film right now. It's a great film. I killed two antelope in two days on a 0.100% draw unit on public land in Wyoming. So tons of great antelope opportunity at low point uh, figures. And then um, Colorado. Colorado, for a couple reasons, is a great opportunity state. There is some over-the-counter opportunity. Um, there are units you can draw 100% on second choice. There are really solid deer units to be drawn with zero into one, two, and three point levels. Now, you might not be getting the premier units in the state, but I'll get into a little more detail. You can draw really solid deer hunts, like rut rifle mule deer hunts and with one, two, three points. Um, even some zero point opportunity. Um, and same with elk. Um, you, can, you can get on hunts uh, for very low points. So if you're starting off and you wanna hone in on like two or three states, which I recommend so you can do a little bit of a rotation, definitely look at Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. All right, so let's jump in here. Um, first, you got your kind of, I don't know what you'd call them, um, eastern states that have elk tags available. So Virginia, just last year, started uh, an elk lottery. So I, of course, applied for a Virginia elk tag and will do so indefinitely until I hopefully one day draw one. Um, also look at Kentucky and Pennsylvania, and I believe even Tennessee now have elk tag draws. So... Um, you know, Virginia only, I think, is allotting five tags, one to a non-resident and four to Virginia residents. So, um, you know, it's, your odds are way better if you're a Virginian, but um, no matter where you are, it's, um, at the end of the day, you're supporting conservation by applying for these tags, and they're cheap. I think the Virginia application is like 15 bucks. So, um, you know, and you, you, like I said, you can't win the game if you don't play it. So you might one day draw one of these tags. My uncle, for example, drew a Kentucky elk tag, killed a nice six point a few years ago. So, um, you know, pick your, pick your poison there, but I, I recommend go ahead and putting in for at least a couple of those. Like I said, I put in for Virginia every year. I have put for Kentucky in the past. I have I didn't do it this year, but, um, why not? Um, Okay, I'll try to go a little bit here in order of like when things become available just to keep things kind of in chronological order, but the, the application season is pretty much going to start off with Idaho, and they go on sale. Basically, it's, it's over-the-counter sales, but not really because they have it. Unless you live in Idaho or somewhere nearby where you can actually go in person, you're going to be doing an online queue an online waiting game and so basically you log in on December 1st and you get randomly assigned a spot in line uh, and I mean <laughs> in years past I've been like 40 50 thousand I think this year I got like three or four thousand and I was like actually excited about that but you know to be honest if you're not in the you know couple hundreds range, which I've never been, um, you're probably not going to get your first, second, or even third, like, choice. Um, but anyway, you just got to try. So go into that one with a battery of options. Like, I mean, I usually go in with like three options, but like, I've never even got my first three. So I would go in with, you know, a plan and maybe your top four or five different options. Um, and so deer units are numbered and then it's a little confusing because deer units are numbered, but the elk tags are elk zones, which are named like they have different like names instead of numbers. So, um, so go in there, go to the Idaho, uh, game of fish website. You can look up which I, I like to go in and, and try to find um, concurrent tags. So you got to look at the, t the season dates and the zone. But my strategy for that is to find places where, if possible, I can get um, an elk tag and a deer tag that overlap 
so that when I go out there, I just have a better shot at if I see a deer or an elk, I can take either one. Uh, now, not everyone's going to have the bandwidth for that, but um, this year, like I said, all my first choice options were gone. I did, however, pick a pick up a deer tag for uh, October, and to, just to be honest with you guys, I got it as a backup. Like, I 90% chance will not hunt that tag, but just in the line of work I'm in, like, not having a hunt to do is not really an option, so it's nice to be able to just pick one up and know, no matter what happens in the rest of the draws, I have a deer tag in Idaho in October that I can hunt if I need to, and it's in a unit where I know folks that live nearby, so I can get logistical help, and also probably uh, they might know something about the unit. So... I went ahead and picked up a deer tag knowing I probably won't hunt it, but I have the backup option if I need. Now, if you just want to get on a hunt, um, you can do it. So, you know, throw in there December 1st for Idaho and, and grab a tag. Now, Idaho does have limited entry tags that come up later in the season. The draw odds on most of those hunts is extremely low for non-residents, but still worth putting in for. All right, I'm going to move on now to Alaska. I believe Alaska is December 15th is when the draw opens. Now, um, there's still quite a few good over-the-counter options in Alaska. For example, for black bear, caribou, um, Sitka black-tailed deer, etc., etc. Um, and one good thing about Alaska is they don't wait months to give you the draw results. I do not understand why these states do this. It's such a pain in the butt for guys like me who are applying multiple places. It's a computer system. Why do you have to wait two months to put draw results out? Just like, they could probably do it the next day if they wanted to, but I have no idea why they decided to draw it out. Anyway, Alaska is pretty quick, so that's good. Um, you know, I did put in for Alaska uh, this year um, with an outfitter, I put in for a sheep tag. Um, so the Alaska hunts are pretty low draw odds as well, but just like with anywhere else, you put in with an outfitter, you're going to have better success. Um, I'm debating whether I should even say this, but also <laughs> you can see, I'll just say this. You can, there's a way you can go onto Alaska and literally see like where any person applied. I'm, I'm going to leave it there. But you can see what people applied for. Um, I didn't draw anything in Alaska this year, um, but hopefully one day I will be able to hunt sheep there. Um, I'm going to keep running through the states kind of in order and dropping some personal notes in there, and then I'm going to talk about my specific personal strategy. Um, so that's Alaska. Again, if you don't draw anything in Alaska, there's still great opportunity over the counter um, for caribou, although access is an issue. Sick of blacktail, same thing. Um, your, your biggest limiting factor in Alaska is going to be access and transporters. Um, while you might be able to get a caribou tag if you want to fly in somewhere, you might have to plan that two or three years in advance. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. Um, that's the limiting factor there. So the next ones that usually come up, um, are Wyoming, I believe, um, antelope and non-resident elk. Um, so, and, and Wyoming and Montana are the two states I started with and the points only period, I believe begins in July. I think it's July 1st. So, uh, I have, I think, four points for pretty much everything in Wyoming. My strategy is to continue banking points for deer in Wyoming and wait for some of those better units. Um, I've been using my Wyoming points for antelope. I've gone, done two Wyoming antelope hunts, and in two hunts I've killed three antelope. So both of these bucks are Wyoming bucks, and then I killed a doe as well this last year, um, which you can pick up a doe tag pretty easily for 50 bucks in most places um, <clears throat> over the counter. Or I think you have to put in for it, but it's like almost a guarantee. Um, okay, so Wyoming, I'm trying to see here. Um, 
I put in this year for General Elk, which used to be uh, pretty much guaranteed draw at four points. I believe it's down to like 35% now, draw odds for four points. So I put in for um, General Elk. Another thing to keep in mind about Wyoming is non-residents cannot hunt wilderness without a local guide. And unless they're unless it's a registered guide, you cannot legally pay someone to take you in. So basically you have to pay a real registered guide to take you or have a really, really nice friend who's willing to sacrifice their own time for you uh, to take you into wilderness area. Um, now I'm fortunate, I, I have a friend, uh, shout, out, uh, shout out to you brother, um, who has offered to do that if I draw to take me into wilderness. So. That could be a possibility, um, but keep that in mind. Um, I'm trying to see if there's anything else worth mentioning there. Like I said, it's a great opportunity state for antelope. Elk and deer are getting harder to draw, but it's um, it's easy to pick up points starting in July. The, the points only uh, window is July through October, and um, I, I just started buying points there for everything, like a while ago, so I would recommend doing that. Um, I'm going to hit Arizona next. Arizona is a tough state to draw in, <clears throat> but has some great opportunity. Um, for years, I had just been buying points, and shout out to Trail uh, Kreitzer. There's, you, there's an option to get your points and still apply for hunts in Arizona. So you don't have to do one or the other. You can apply, and if you don't get it, you'll get the points. So there's really no reason to not apply in Arizona. Like, there's no reason to only put it in for points because it's like, why not just take the chance that you might draw something? Um, now, here's an important point. If you're going to do it, I recommend buying point guard. Now, point guard basically allows you to, if you need to return the tag, keep your points. So, and this came in huge for me this year because, to be honest with you guys, I was kind of in a rush when I was applying for Arizona. I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, I wasn't being as detail-oriented as I should have been. And I actually put in for a cow tag as my first choice on accident, and I drew it. <laughs> so when Arizona point uh, results came back, I was like, oh, no way. I drew. I was like freaking out. And I looked, and it's a cow tag. Now, nothing wrong with cow tags. If you guys want meat and you want to do stuff, that's great. Like, do it. Um, me, personally, I don't want to put in the logistics and time and effort and going out and doing a hunt and using all my points for a cow tag. So, But because I bought point guard, I can surrender my tag and still retain my points. So two takeaways there. Make sure you know what you're applying for because you just might draw something you don't want. Another takeaway is if you want a cow tag, apparently they're not that hard to draw because I drew one. And buy point guard in Arizona. In case something happens, you can get your points back. Uh, and there's more to point guard than that. Uh, I'm just not exactly remembering it, but it's worth it. Get to the point guard. Um, the other thing, too, is, guys, it's not expensive to get points in most of these states. Yes, if you draw the tag, in certain states you got to buy the license, but you're talking most places, like, in the $15 to $50 range for points. Um, in a lot of places, you can even buy points for spouses or children. And one more thing I wanted to say here. Um, like I said, I'm not an expert do not take what I'm saying as gospel or like, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an expert. Make sure you're doing your due diligence and researching and checking things out on your own because I might make mistakes as I'm talking here and I don't want to lead anybody astray. So do not take what I'm saying as legal advice or gospel. Make sure you're double checking stuff, but this is hopefully going to be helping out some people. Okay, anyway, um, Montana is confusing. Just like Wyoming, they have a points-only window that opens in July. And years ago, I started buying points in Montana, and I was like, yeah, man, this is sick. I have like three or four, I have like three points for everything in Montana. 
only to come to find out that I had preference points but not bonus points. And the way Montana works is you bonus points affect your ability to draw a general tag. Okay, so like I said earlier, at zero bonus points, you have about 50 to 60%. One, it goes down slightly, and then two and three, it's back up to high draw odds. Um, but preference points only affect limited entry units. Okay, so the way it works is in Montana, you must draw a general tag first, and if you do, then your preference points will be applied to a limited entry tag which you can apply for. It's pretty confusing. And then also in, um, in Montana you have the deer combo, elk combo, and big game combo. Deer combo is for deer only. Elk combo is for elk only. Big game combo is for deer or elk. And for whatever reason has slightly better draw odds than the deer combo or the elk combo. So this year I applied for the big game combo. Plus I just like having that flexibility because last year on my deer hunt, we saw tons of elk. Now granted I was not in a general elk unit, which you need to check. Make sure because there are some units that are general deer units that are not general elk units. And I'm sure there's probably some vice versa. So make sure when you get that combo tag that you are in a general deer and a general elk unit before you pull the trigger. But I like having that option of if you see a nice bull while you're out deer hunting or vice versa, you got the option. So, and like I said, the combo tag actually has a little bit better draw odds. Um, let's see. Um, preference points. Um, I always get confused on this or bonus points, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that when you buy or when you apply for your tag in Montana, you have the option to say, if I'm unsuccessful, give me a bonus point. But here's the thing. If you buy that bonus point, then it goes onto that year's draw. So for example, this year I went in with zero points, giving me a 60% chance of drawing. Had I got the bonus point when I applied, that would take my draw odds down to almost zero. So you can kind of ride the zero point wave in Montana if you're cool with, you know, having that 60% odds thing. If you want to get into the higher draw success percentages or like guaranteed draws you got to play the long game so you have to basically apply for a year or two or three or whatever a year or two knowing you're probably not going to draw it to build up to pass that one bonus point kind of thing where it's like a zero percent draw this is probably getting really confusing hopefully you're following along but um anyway um if you want to apply and have a 60% odds or 50% odds, don't get the bonus point. But if you want to play the long game and hunt, like and have like a guaranteed draw in two or three years, get your bonus point and then just and do it that way. So I know that's confusing, but that's just the best way I can explain it. Um, New Mexico, straight lottery for everything, which is awesome because it's less confusing, but your draw odds are lower. Now, you can still draw. I drew a amazing elk tag last year. Uh, I think it was the second or third year I applied to Mexico. I drew a, new, uh, a muzzleloader tag and killed, a, killed my first bull. Amazing hunt. Awesome place to hunt. I recommend everybody apply for New Mexico if you're the bandwidth. Here's the only problem in New Mexico is when you apply, they will charge the full amount of those of those licenses onto your credit card and you will only get refunded if and when you do not draw so like for me i applied for i have like thousands of dollars on my credit card that's going to be on my credit card for months until those draw odds those draw results come back and i think it even like took my credit score down a couple of points last year to be honest it came back but like you're gonna have to be comfortable with like having 
debt on your credit card for months until those things come back. Um, but, you know, it's there's some really cool opportunity in New Mexico. And just like anywhere else, you're going to have better success if you go in uh, in the outfitter draw. Now, in order to be in the outfitter draw, you have to have a signed contract with a legit New Mexico outfitter and then use that outfitter's number when you apply. Now, that will give you better results, um, but then you're kind of locked into using that outfitter. Um, now, I, I chose to go with my friend Ryan and Cole's service called Blackhorn Guide Service. Blackhorn Guide Service. Uh, great guys, super knowledgeable. Um, and so I applied under their outfitter number. Um, and I applied again for uh, Muzzleloader Elk, Ibex, Oryx. And um, the deer opportunity, from what I'm hearing, there's good opportunity as far as getting tags but it's a very tough hunt because of when it occurs. Um, so it's not a great deer opportunity state in my opinion, but it's definitely worth applying for elk. And, um, you know, I'm not applying for Barbary sheep because I'm going to do that again in Texas, but Oryx, Ibex and elk are what I applied for in New Mexico. And, um, Man, what a great place to hunt. So if you're comfortable with a little bit of debt on your card, I would go ahead and go crazy and just apply for everything in New Mexico if you can. Okay, Colorado. Colorado is one of my favorite states. I think the system is very good there. I hope the liberals don't destroy it, but I think it's a, a really good state for, for opportunity. Like I said, you get on some great hunts for elk and deer at low point totals. Um, and... You can buy points only. Um, many of these states you can, some you can't. Uh, Colorado, you can buy points only. So a few years ago, I started buying points um, for elk, deer, bear, uh, antelope, everything, basically, in Colorado. Um, when you go to apply in Colorado, make sure you have the regulations pulled up because when you do apply, you have to put your hunt codes in by number even if you're doing points only. Now, if it's points only, you're gonna put like P99999P as your first choice hunt codes. Again, that's P99999P as your hunt code for points only. But have the regs pulled up on a tab on your computer because everything else, you're gonna need the specific hunt code and it's um, you gotta be careful. like that you're picking the right one. So have the regs open and, um, and put in your choices. Now, um, like I said, there's some great opportunity there. The other thing that's great about Colorado for guys like me is that, <clears throat> for example, last year I put in for, I drew a Colorado antelope tag, but so basically what I will do in Colorado is I will apply for certain things as backups because it's hard to tell you without giving you an example. Okay, so basically if you draw a tag, you can return your tag and get a refund on your money or keep your points. You can't do both, but you can either get a refund on your money or you can eat the tag cost but keep your points. Now, I know I'm in a, u a unique position, but for me, multiple years worth of points are worth more than the couple hundred bucks for the tag. So um, it's a great place to apply as a backup. And if you don't get drawn other places, you can hunt it. And if you do, you can return it and keep your points. And I'll get into my specific strategy on that to give you an example a little bit later. Uh, Utah, there's some great over-the-counter opportunity there. Uh, you can check out my podcast with Ryan Muncy. He killed and his and his buddy both killed bulls this year over-the-counter rifle elk. Um, so look into that. But uh, uh, their tag, their application period just opened yesterday, March 21st. <clears throat> so I literally just like right before recording this, picked up points just like everyone else. I buy a point for like every single species. I my my fall is already really full, so this year Utah is not really on the on the plate. But I, like every year, bought points for everything, 
and um, it's pretty easy to do. Um, Nevada, same thing, some amazing hunts there, but they're pretty tough to draw, so I just started buying points for everything years ago. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, Oregon, some great over-the-counter, very great over-the-counter, as I experienced this year, options for deer and elk. Um, but again, every state that offers a points only thing, even if I think it's not worth it or I'll never hunt there, I just buy them anyway because who knows, you know, like in 10 years I might have a, just a mountain of points in some random state and then I might want to hunt there. Like I find out something about, you know, who knows? I don't know. So I just buy points everywhere. Um, so basically Oregon, Washington, and I need to look into a little further. I actually don't think I've done anything in Washington yet, which is weird, but um, there's also some cool stuff to apply for in the Dakotas. And I started buying points in California even a couple years ago. There's some good deer and even some cool elk opportunities in California. Um, okay, so that's kind of a rundown on the different states. Let me tell you real quick what my strategy was for this year. And hopefully that will kind of help illustrate some of this stuff. So, you know, I'm always trying to maximize hunts. I'm trying to, when possible, do over-the-counter hunts so I can continue point banking places that I will need to draw points for later. Um, and I'm looking at opportunities for, for different things. So, um, and, and getting the most hunts I can out of the fall. Um, so like I said, I start off, I pick up some kind of backup in Idaho if I can. I'll apply for Alaska. Um, so if you want to start your season as early as possible, that's usually going to be August. There's some great high country mule deer archery options across the West and different places in August. Um, even I think some in July, which is crazy, but, um, for me, where I'm at right now, um, I'm looking at other options in August, which is mainly going to be in Alaska or, as I'm doing this year, in Oregon. So, uh, in Washington as well. Uh, so, um, in Oregon, you can get over-the-counter fall bear tags. And I have good friends in Oregon um, who offered to take me hunting with them this year. So I'm starting off with a fall bear hunt the first week of August in Oregon. As an over-the-counter tag, um, it's pretty cheap, easy to get, fun hunt. It's in August. Why not, right? Um, so that's what I'm doing in August. September, obviously everyone thinks elk in September. And... I do too. However, as you guys know, if you know me, I have a Alaska and a caribou kind of bent. Um, you know, caribou options are dwindling every year. I do not know how long I will be able to hunt caribou. But as this recording is happening right now, there is still over-the-counter and DIY caribou options. So most people think of hunting caribou in... Uh, August. However, I've hunted caribou a couple times in August. Killing, I killed my first caribou bull this year in August, velvet. Um, but I've always, and I've been to August, I've been to Alaska several times, but always in August. And I've always wanted to go to Alaska in September when things are a little bit closer to fall, colors are changing, weather's changing, and just I really want a hard horned bull. Like um, I don't know, just something about those things when they're hard horned and the fall colors. I'm super attracted to that. So not only, like I said, are the opportunities dwindling for caribou, I have a desire to kill one hard horned. Also, I could have gotten on a muzzleloader or an archery elk hunt in September, but I want to keep banking points for a better hunt later. So I am making the decision to hold off on elk still in September. And I... I rented a freaking Toro truck. I got an F-250 reserved for about two day, two weeks, the first part of September. And, um, you know, I tried calling every place I could, talking to everybody I could to get a 
transport a good transporter like an airplane or even a boat again to take me somewhere in Alaska couldn't find it so I said you know what I'm gonna do a haul road hunt it's gonna be a really cool DIY story it's one of the last true DIY caribou adventures you can have and I don't know how, how much longer it's gonna be there so I'm flying to Fairbanks and I'm driving a truck to the Arctic Circle and I'm gonna try to head home with with a caribou bowl and I think it's gonna be a sick adventure and allow me to keep point banking for elk hunts in September later. So I'm super stoked for that. So that's my plan in September. Flying to Fairbanks, got a truck reserved on Turo. If you haven't heard of that, it's a, a rideshare rental app you should check into. Um, and I'm heading up the haul road and I'm gonna kill a bull and I can't wait. Um, okay, October. October's a weird month, okay, because October is a really tough time to hunt mule deer. It's um, kind of a tough time to hunt elk too, unless you get like a really early October hunt or you're kind of maybe down in New Mexico or something. This year I was in New Mexico in October and it was a rut fest and the bulls are going crazy. That's not really the norm. You know, usually it's gonna be a tougher elk hunt um, and it's gonna be a tougher deer hunt. So I, I'm always kind of like trying to figure out what to do in October. So right now I got several things in the air for October. Um, like I said, I have I applied for Wyoming General Rifle Elk, and I applied for the Montana uh, Big Game Combo. So I think I have a 35% draw in Wyoming, and I have about a 60% chance of drawing in um, Montana. If I draw one of those, I will do Rifle Elk in October. And then, of course, I always apply for, you know, bighorn sheep and goat everywhere I can, too. Just in the crazy off chance that I win the lottery and get one of those tags. Of course, that'll take precedent. Um, but, and, and also, of course, I applied for, like I said, Oryx, Ibex, and Elk in New Mexico. All of those I applied for October hunts. So if I draw one of those, those will take precedent. So basically, I'm really waiting for draws for October to figure out what I'm going to do. It's either going to be rifle elk or some kind of other crazy hunt that I just might get lucky or get blessed and draw. But it's likely going to be a rifle elk hunt. Um, and, you know, to be honest, if, if, if I just completely strike out and don't draw anything, I can hunt my Idaho deer tag. That's why I have that back up. And <laughs> I even have an Arizona cow tag if I really want. But I'm setting myself up to probably be rifle elk hunting or some other crazy tag if I get blessed. And if all else fails, I got a pretty decent Idaho deer tag. I'll go hunt and, and I'll have a great time. Which you can return those. And also, thing to note, Montana, you can return uh, for an 80% refund to a certain point. And then after a certain date, it drops to a 50% refund and then it goes down from there. But you can return the Montana tag for a at least 80% refund. Um, Wyoming, to be honest, I'm not sure if you can return tags there or not. Um, I would check with Jaden Bales on that one. He's the Wyoming guy. Um, okay, and that brings us to November. November for me is the is the month of the deer. Like I I if I you know every November I can hunt mule deer during the rut like that's what I'm going to be doing like that takes precedence I love deer I absolutely love mule deer if you can get on a decent mule deer hunt during the rut like that's the ultimate for me so in a perfect world I will draw my Wyoming general elk tag and I'll hunt that in October or some other cool hunt and I will also draw my Montana combo tag at which point I will use that to deer hunt in November in one of the general units in Eastern Montana. I love that hunt. That Eastern Montana hunt is super cool. Um, just hunting mule deer in the rut, in the breaks country. Yeah, you're probably not going to kill a 180, 200-inch buck. You know, it, like I said, it's an opportunity state. It's not a trophy state. But I love that hunt. I love that country. Super cool. We'd be stoked to do that. Um, but... If I don't, this is where the Colorado return thing comes in handy. I just decided to, uh, in Colorado, I applied yesterday. Um, I went on and found 
the best unit I could find that was 100% draw at my point level. So I found a unit with the highest success rate and highest amount of public land possible with 100% draw at my point level, and I applied there. That way, if I don't draw anything else uh, for November for that deer hunt in November, I will have a backup of a solid Colorado third rifle deer hunt. Um, if I do draw, then I can return my Colorado tag and get my points back and hunt in Montana or yeah. Um, and if if I don't draw any of those and literally everything just falls through, I'm gonna go back to Oregon and hunt over the counter blacktails. So you always want to have like layers of backups and plans, at least in my in my line of work and thinking. Um, also in Colorado, another thing to note, for example, for elk, as another backup, I went in and found out the units that I could draw for elk like 100% on a second choice. There's only one or two, but I put in for my first choice hunt code for elk as points. And my second choice as a as a hunt, that's a second choice hunt. So I should get a point this year in Colorado and potentially draw my second choice as a backup. Because the only thing about my Colorado situation is you can return your points, but you forfeit your ability to add a point in that season. So... I will get my three points back, but I won't be able to go into next season with four points, if that makes sense. So it's kind of an opportunity cost, like you don't get to get a point. But I decided it's worth it, and there's so much good opportunity in Colorado with with two or three points that it's not that big of a deal. But something to note, something to note, if you put in for points as your first choice and a hunt as your second choice, uh, you can theoretically get a point and a hunt. Anyway, enough on that. Um, So that's my plan. August, September, October, November. Um, I will be going back in January to hunt Audad again. And then I usually do a spring hunt, which would be either over-the-counter spring bear, or um, I may get an opportunity to go to New Zealand with Joe Edlington from J.E. Wilds, but that's still to be determined. In any event, it should be a great year. Oh, I did forget to mention, uh, I had a buddy of mine had some um, New Mexico landowner tags come available for antelope that were a pretty good deal. It's a three-day hunt at the end of September, so I went ahead and jumped on that. It's a DIY rifle hunt. It is on private land, but it's going to be a DIY um, three-day. It's a three-day hunt, potential for a good animal. It's DIY. It was at a good price, so I jumped on it. Uh, so we'll be doing that um, that hunt as well, an antelope hunt in New Mexico. So it's going to be a busy fall. It's going to be an awesome fall. I'm looking forward to it. I don't know if this is going to help you. It might have been super confusing and super rambly. I apologize if so. Hopefully it helped you out in some way. Hopefully some nuggets are in there that will help you guys out. Um, you know, Use your tools. Use Onyx. Use Hunt and Fool. Do your research, um, have plans, have backups, and um, even if you can't hunt this year, even if you're not sure you're going to be able to hunt the year after that, just start buying points. You won't regret it because in two or three years, you're going to have so many options, you're not going to know what to do with them. So just start buying points, if nothing else. Uh, And there's still plenty of time and opportunity to do that, at least in Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. Uh, There's still time, even if you or just listen to this now. So anyway, thank you guys for listening. Again, I hope that helped. Uh, Shoot me a message if this was helpful. If this was helpful at all, shoot me a message. If not, you can also let me know. Leave me a rating or review on the podcast. It's been a while since I asked you guys, but if you could leave me a written review on the podcast on Apple, that'd be super helpful. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Share the show with friends and family. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for listening.